So today's author is Linda Lucas. She's the author and illustrator of Hello Ruby, a children's picture book about the whimsical world of computers, as well as the founder of Rails Girls, Rails Girls, a global movement to teach young women programming in 260 cities. Uh, just to name a few of the honors, she she. Oh, the Finnish people are so shy, they, they won't. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, please. <laughs> so I, 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 only, I only know one Finnish joke that Susa just taught me this week. <laughs> so uh, how do you tell a Finnish introvert from a Finnish extrovert? The Finnish introvert, when sh they speak with you, they look at their feet. <laughs> the Finnish extrovert looks at your feet. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I won't embarrass you more, but <laughs> highly honored and a firm believer that code is literacy in the 21st century and the need for people to speak uh, the ABCs of programming is hugely important. Uh, Linda has studied business, design, engineering at Alto University and product engineering at Stanford. Um, and she's going to talk to us today about how we can m move forward towards a more humane approach to technology. So please. Join me in welcoming Linda to the stage. Thank you. My name is Linda. I'm a children's book author, illustrator, and programmer. And I come from Helsinki, Finland. And I think one of the exciting things about the future is exactly this. Uh, computers are binary. They can be one thing or the other, on or off ones or zeros, but we humans contain multitudes. We can be many things at the same time, and I bet many of your careers will look like the mismatch of my career. Um, this is where I started my career from, from the idea that if code is truly the next universal language, instead of grammar classes, we ought to be teaching poetry lessons. And the idea behind this sentence is that we don't learn a language by only conjugating the irregular verbs or practicing the grammar rules. We learn a language by speaking it, by singing it, by dancing it. And in the same way, even though programming is not a natural language, we ought to be diversifying the means and ways we teach this new language for the next generation. And my way of doing it is through stories. So when I was studying in Stanford, I was really frustrated with the computer science books out there, which were so boring and dull and gray. And the programming language I was practicing at the time was called Ruby. So I started to do these little doodles at the margins of my computer science books and imagining how a six-year-old girl would explain the concepts of functional programming or object-oriented uh, programming. And slowly, out of that experience, the foundation for the work I do right now was born. Even though we have these amazing opportunities to learn about programming, everything from the puzzle-based activities of code.org, I know Microsoft sponsors a lot, to the open-ended playground of Scratch, there was something that I think was missing from the way we teach these uh, future skills for our children. And that thing was stories. Because stories, in some way, they help us make sense of the world, they help us understand ourselves, and they help us understand each other. And this is what good stories have done throughout the humankind's history. And no one was telling stories about the world of software. So I decided to do that. And today the Hello Ruby book series has been translated into 28 languages, everywhere from the Arabic to the Japanese to uh, Dutch to, to French. And my job is to speak with teachers, parents, educators, policymakers, even board members about the role technology will have in our future lives. And this is what I think I do today. Instead of teaching kids coding, I actually prepare kids for a world where so many of the problems around us are computer problems. The big, hairy, fuzzy problems of education, health, nutrition, energy, they are computer problems at their core. But the current engineers and their way of thinking won't be solving those problems. So we need a radically more diverse group of people to get excited about computer science as a discipline. And the worst thing that pretty much happened to computer science was the decision to call it computer science. Because often, when we, for instance, hear that someone is a physicist, we think that, oh, a physicist is a person who studies the physical world. And when we hear that someone is a biologist, we think that, oh, that is a person who studies the biological world. So it's a very easy error to think that, oh, a computer scientist is a person who studies the computer. But that's not true. 
a computer scientist uses the computer to study the world and solve the big problems in the world. And that's why I think we need more computer scientists who understand the computer as a tool of self-expression and as a tool of problem solving. And for today's talk, instead of a traditional book talk, I figured that I would give you the A, B and C of technology education. And A, obviously, is for the word algorithm. So algorithm is a funny word because I bet many of you just felt a shiver of distrust and you thought about Facebook and you thought about finance sector. But for kids, the word algorithm is an amazing word. They think it's a very adult word. It sounds really good and big in their mouth. And they know that an algorithm is just a step-by-step -step solution to a problem. Nothing more complex than that. So we practice, and we practice by first doing this activity where one of the children is the computer and one is the programmer. And the programmer's job is to teach the computer to brush its teeth. And you need to think about all the different kinds of things that might go into the act of brushing your teeth, and most of them fail. Because, you know, you need to define what a toothbrush is, and then by the time you said, move the toothbrush to your mouth, you remember, oh, the toothpaste. And then you remember that the toothpaste has a cork, and how on earth will you be able to take the cork off with the toothpaste in one hand and the toothbrush in another? And in this way, by taking apart a big problem and making them into smaller problems, the kids learn to think like a computer scientist would learn to think. But they don't only learn about these thinking skills. They learn about a few other very fundamental things about computer science. First of all, computer science is highly collaborative. Rarely is there a case that one cowboy coder works alone throughout the night. That's just not too true in today's world. Computer scientists work in pairs. It's called pair programming, when you have two pairs of eyes that spot problems better than one. And even more so, coders and programmers work in multidisciplinary teams that have business people, designers, analysts, all kinds of people. So it's not lonely, it's highly collaborative. Then the second thing they learn about is the act of making mistakes and fixing them. It's so typical in programming, you never write perfect code at the get-go, that we have a special name for it, and it's called debugging, the act of going and fixing your code. And this is something people often also forget. They think that there's this mythical programmer who just writes perfect code and constructs these castles in his or her head. But most of the coding, at least I do, is really messy and it requires a lot of persistence, finding and fixing your mistakes. And the final thing they learn about is creativity. Because if I were to ask you to do the same activity again of toothbrushing, odds are we would see 50 or 60 different kinds of algorithms for toothbrushing. Some of them might be more elegant, some of them might be more efficient, but as long as the code works, it's, it's okay. It, it's, uh, there. So that means that computer science, it's not a science, or coding is not a science, it's an art, it's a craft, and there's many creative solutions to every single problem out there. And there's a word for these things, these concepts and these practices that we computer scientists use before we write even a single line of code. So those concepts cover things like understanding decomposition, taking apart a big problem into smaller pieces, pattern recognition skills, systems thinking skills, logical and critical thinking skills. But very importantly, they also include practices, those of collaboration, persistence, creativity, debugging. Because even though you would have the world's best person who understands algorithms thoroughly, who doesn't have the persistence to keep going when the algorithm fails, or the collaboration skills to work with other people, they are not going to make it in the work life. But this is not the algorithm most of you are thinking. Algorithms can be thought about as cupcake recipes, because this highlights the other side of algorithms. Once you write a perfect instruction, you can repeat it over and over again. So those of you who have made cupcakes, rarely do you make one cupcake. You often make a hundred cupcakes. And you, with a good recipe, you can make a thousand cupcakes. And you can change the flavor of the cupcakes from bananas to blueberries. And this is the power of an algorithm. A sequence of instructions that can be done over and over again with scale. When you give instructions to someone, that is an algorithm. And again, these might seem like very innocent and quirky examples of an algorithm, so let me give you a little bit more mathematical example. 
So an algorithm, a step-by-step -step instruction to solving a problem, I start by giving kids this example. I give them five numbers and I ask them to put these numbers in order of magnitude so that the smallest is on the left-hand side and the biggest is on the right-hand side. And it takes the kids roughly two, three minutes to do this task. And then I ask them to do these numbers, and then eventually these numbers, and then they start to yawn and say, oh, this is too difficult. And I say, this was lesson number one. Never compete with a computer on a task like this. Because this is where you will always fail. Computers will always be faster, more efficient, make less mistakes in organizing, for instance, numbers. But you know what? They still need instructions. And those instructions are written by us humans. So a way a computer would approach this problem is like this. It would start from the beginning and it would compare 1 and 56 and it would say, oh, 56 is bigger than 1, let's give it like this. It would move to the next pair, it would compare 56 to 4, it would say 4 is smaller than 56, let's swap this around. It would move to 56 and 70, this looks okay. 70 to 20, 20 is smaller than 70, let's swap this around. And then it would move all the way to the beginning and do this loop over and over and over again until the numbers were sorted. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is a bubble sort algorithm. It's a really famous working horse algorithm that was developed, I think, in the 60s or the 70s. Still powers a lot of the stuff we do every single day online. But it was not done by the computer. It was a human who wrote step-by-step -step instructions to solve a problem, in this situation, sorting problems. Another thing when we think about algorithms, so step-by-step -step instructions, uh, math, but the algorithms I want the children to understand are actually the algorithms are, that are hiding in plain sight. So I show them a picture of a search engine, and I ask, where is the algorithm hiding in this page? And they look at the page for a long time and they say, maybe ads, and I say, yes, there's an algorithm an engineer wrote that takes into account the thing you're searching for, your search history, your location, probably tries to make a guess of your gender, and through these instructions, it tries to show you the right kind of ads, and also the order in which you see the search results. That's defined by an algorithm. What about a social networking site? Where is the algorithm hiding here? Ads, the kids say, and I say, bingo, yes, the ads but also the order in which you see the social media updates. That's defined by an algorithm because someone somewhere wrote an algorithm that tries to maximize the amount of time you spend on this site. So it takes into account how much time you go spending on other people's profiles and tries to make guesses on uh, what kind of content you would like. And then the final example, a video service. And ads the kids already recognize, they talk about how when you type something into a video service, it gives you a recommendation or, or tries to guess the word you're trying to type in, and the kinds of videos that get suggested to you. But surprisingly, more and more of the content that is also developed for us is defined by an algorithm. On YouTube, for instance, there's 400 hours of new content uploaded every one minute. And that means there's no way a human can shift through all of this new content. So we need an algorithm. And this is the dark side of algorithms. When there's these Eastern European content farms that just push out crappy, crappy content for our children, these surprise Play-Doh, eggs, Peppa Pig, stamper cars, mashups that are actually not done for humans. They are done for computers. And this is the part of algorithms I want the children to be able to have a frank, optimistic and pragmatic conversation about. That they don't feel that computers are these black boxes they don't have ownership or control over. And this brings us, oopla, a few extra ones. This brings us to the way we teach. Because for the educators in the room, there's nothing new in this uh, way of thinking. Already in the 1950s, Jean Piaget said when it came to math education that you can't offer an entirely organized intellectual discipline for someone by giving them these pre-organized vocabularies and concepts. That true learning is grounded in action. And that means we need to start grounding computer science away from the abstract into the action. 
And there's all kinds of motivations of play uh, we use when we teach children. This is uh, a study done by Lego Foundation. And they say there's achievement motivation, there's social motivation, and there's immersion motivation for play. But for some reason, whenever we talk about computer science and coding, we only talk about the achievement. We talk about gamification, points, numbers, challenging others. And we forget that there's so much more in coding and computer science. There's finding and giving support to one another, there's collaboration, there's exploration, there's joy of finding a new way of solving a problem. So I would encourage all of you in the room who think about these things to really explore all the different aspects of play while teaching. And in this way, I'm hoping that we can as mentioned, take computer science away from the high intellectual discipline uh, it's been made into, into something kinetic, into something real, and most importantly, also show the context of what the children are learning. And this brings us to B, which is for Boolean logic. And it starts from the concept of a computer. I see that there's a few people who probably were growing up in the 1970s and I must confess, I'm really jealous for you. Because you could actually open a transistor radio, you could touch a transistor. For my generation, you can jam 300 million transistors at the pinpoint of a pen. But computers, they've become these sealed silver containers that hide all of the complexity from us and thus they become very foreign. And sometimes I wish I could shrink myself to the size of a silicone ship and go inside of a computer and learn how it works from the inside out. Unfortunately, that's not possible unless you're a children's book author. So that's exactly what I did with Ruby. In the second Ruby book, uh, she goes into dad's office and she types the password in, but the computer doesn't work. And all of a sudden, the white mouse, it wakes up to Ruby and says, Ruby, Ruby, I've lost touch with the cursor. Can you help me find the cursor? And Ruby says, oh, of course, I'm the best computer debugger I know of. And together, they fall deep, deep, deep inside of the computer to the layer of electricity where there's billions of tiny switches that only know how to go on and off, on and off. They either pass electricity or they don't pass electricity. They are ones and zeros, and we call them bits. And technically, you could find the cursor here, but it takes forever to talk to the bits because you need eight of them for a single letter. And Ruby says, let's climb higher. So they meet the logic gates that take the bits, that are these tiny mathematical operators that take these bits and do a little bit more complex things with them, but still at the level of first grade math. And Ruby says, this seems complicated, let's climb higher. So they meet the hardware layer of the computer, where there's the CPU, the central processing unit, that is really bossy and gives instructions to everyone else, but is really forgetful, so it needs help from the RAM and the ROM and the hard drive. And they meet the operating system of the computer. There's the Microsoft cat over there <laughs> somewhere, or the Windows cat. And they finally do find the cursor. Uh, I won't spoil you how they find the cursor. You will need to read the book for that. But most importantly, they get this sense of how computers move from electricity to logic, how logic turns into hardware, how hardware turns into software, and how software turns into the apps, games, and programs we use every single day. And as a result, I hope that this generation of children will realize that while computers are magical, they are not made of magic. While computers are magical, they are not made of magic. They are made of logic. And thus, they can be built and understood by us humans. And often I ask children to draw what they imagine is inside of a computer. And for the computer scientists in the room, this is a hard task because computers are vastly complex. And you would get really perplexed and think, oh, I can't do this answer. But the kids start drawing. And I've asked kids around the world to draw these examples. And they go into a few buckets. There's always the content creators, the kids who imagine that inside of computers there's files and there's uh, games and stuff like that. And this is one way of understanding what computers do. There's linkers, these kids who draw these abstract interconnected networks of different components, the future computer architects maybe. 
the skenographers who draw these exquisite stories about the different characters inside of a computer. I love this because I use a lot of metaphors to explain how computers work. There's even the gear gurus, the kids who imagine that there's tiny gears inside of a computer. And while this is obviously not true, they grasp something about how the smallest part of a computer does a fairly simple thing. But when you put a lot of them together, they can do pretty powerful stuff. And then there's the drafters who draw the transistors, the electricity. And all of these kids grasp the idea that computers can take a thousand forms and have a thousand faces. And un uh, unboxing, unboxing the computer, opening it up, is important because this generation of children will be the last one to remember a computer defined by the screen, by the keyboard or the mouse. The next generation already now has discussions with voice assistants and their computers will be hidden in their toothbrushes and in their teddy bears. So we better start thinking about how do we explain the concept of a computer when we can't rely on the idea of screen time. Because I show kids these pictures. I show them a car, a grocery store, a dog, and a toilet. And I ask which one of these is a computer. And five years ago when I started, kids would say none of those are computers. But today, they very confidently say that, of course, self-driving car, that's a computer. And computers ha uh, cars have a navigation system, so it is a computer. And they list all the kinds of computers they see in a grocery store, ranging from the sensors that open the doors when you walk in to the cashier's machine. And dogs are not computers, but a lot of kids talk about robot dogs and how some countries have dogs with microchips inside of them, so if they run away, you can find the dog. And then I tell the kids that in Japan, toilets are computers and you can modify the heat and the pressure of the water and the music and there's even hackers who hack the toilets. And that is like the biggest mic drop moment there is with six-year-olds. Nothing else will get discussed for the rest of the day. <laughs> But they figure out that there's probably hundreds of computers in every single home because your doorbell is a computer, your microwave is a computer. And then I give this task where I give this little on-off button to the children. And I tell them that for this afternoon alone, the sticker, you put on its, uh, uh, it on something. And for this afternoon alone, you can make anything in this room into a computer. So what could a tuna can do if it was a computer? What could uh, scissors or, or shampoo bottle? And then I had a little girl who came to me and she shows a bicycle lamp. And she said, if this bicycle lamp was a computer, I could go on a biking trip with my father. We could sleep in a tent and this bicycle lamp, it could also be a movie projector. <laughs> and that's the moment I'm looking for. Not the moment when the kid understands the differences between Ruby and Python or learns to type an if-else statement on JavaScript, but the moment when they understand three profound truths we adults tend to forget. First of them is that the world is not ready yet. There's so much we haven't discovered or invented yet. And there's a famous sci-fi writer who said that everything that happens in technology before you turn 30 is exciting and fun and whimsical. And everything that happens after 30 is weird and unnatural and somewhat suspicious. And I'm 33 and I'm starting to notice myself moving into this category of people that's like, is Snapchat really necessary? But the truth is, there is a lot we haven't invented yet. So let's keep an open mind. The second thing she realizes is that technology is a wonderful way to make the world a little bit more ready. Because technology scales, technology creates wealth around it. And if we look at technology in a little bit more broader perspective, it's always been the way humankind has advanced. And the final and most important thing she realizes is that for a moment there, she felt that she could be the world's first computer uh, movie projector, bicycle lamp inventor. And that is the thing I want our children, but also as adults, to keep in mind. Because so often we create these binary silos in the world saying that these people can create with technology, these people only consume it. And that's not true. I think we all should be part of the creation. So how do you explain what a computer is? for a generation that won't be able to recognize it in the same way as we do. In order to explain, I think it's curious that we need to go all the way to the back to the year 1945, so 70 years back in time, and meet 
a scientist called John von Neumann, who coins the idea of von Neumann architecture, which a little bit simplified states that computers are devices where you input data, you process that data somehow, and out comes the modified data. And computers at the time were bigger than this room. Today they fit into our pockets, but the basic operating principle of a computer is still the same. So when you go on Facebook and like a post, in goes the uh, information to the sensor that someone has liked this post, out comes the updated like count. But when you go in a car and you forget to buckle your seatbelt, in goes the information that someone is sitting here and out comes the beep, beep, beep noise we hate so much. And there's a lot of sensors in the world and there's a lot of data in the world. And understanding computer science through the input process output um, is one of the most important frameworks of thinking I think we can give to our children. And this brings me to the idea of the notional machine. Because in some ways I don't think it's important for our children to learn code. It's as uh, unnecessary to learn to memorize different code languages as it was to memorize, say, English. But what I think we should be giving to our children is the concept of a notional machine. We should give them a robust mental model of what a computer is good at doing and what a human is good at doing. And this brings me to the final theme of today, which stands for C and is creativity and computers. And it's the topic of artificial intelligence and machine learning I know many of you here in the room are thinking about. So here's the challenge. Whenever I read a newspaper, there's a few articles about AI and machine learning, and they are all written in a very pessimistic and very scared way. It's almost like there's this medieval map, and everything unknown, everything we don't understand, is just marked with, here be the dragons, don't go here. And we evoke these ideas of Terminator and Skynet into the discussion, to the point where I was in London a year ago and a little boy came to me and said, Linda, what will I do when I grow up if robot takes all my jobs? And I say, don't you worry about that, love, we'll figure it out. But then I realized that it's so important that our children will get a pragmatic and optimistic idea about machine learning and AI. Because these children will be the next generation that will build the technology. And our current personal computer revolution is built around the optimism of Northern California. The Steve Jobses and Bill Gates of the world who had this wonderful experience growing up with computers, uh, hobby computers, and seeing the creativity. And imagine what kind of a bleak future these kids who are now afraid of computers will build in the next 40 to 50 years unless we give them tools to do more. And the first thing I tell to the little boy is that don't worry. There's many kinds of human intelligences. Some of you are really good at singing. Some of you can do cartwheels really well. And it would be really weird to think that one computer intelligence could replace all the kinds of human intelligences we humans have. So focus on understanding what your strengths are and what your intelligence can do well. And then let's figure out how the computer can complement that intelligence. And then when it comes to AI, we talk about something called the strong and weak AI. And yes, in some ways and in some domains, the artificial, the computer intelligence does things much better than the human intelligence. But those areas are very narrow and the advancements in AI, they haven't gone any, gotten any closer to the common sense, to the way we humans perceive the world than it was in the 1960s or the 70s. What has happened is that we've had a lot of progress. But as AI keeps progressing, our definition of AI keeps moving ahead. So we have these discussions around where AI is hiding in everyday items. And we talk about how when, um, when in the 1980s we could have shown like a modern phone and said that I can ask a question from this phone uh, and receive an answer from anywhere in the world within milliseconds that would have been considered AI. Now we just say that it's a search engine. And another thing we talk about is that AI is not only robust, that actually the far more interesting stuff that is happening in, uh, in AI is when we have a lot of data, and that data is being packaged into different kinds of products. So the most kind of substantial and world-shattering AI is actually built into the services, into the civil society, into the way the infrastructure we use around us. So no worry, uh, don't uh, spend time fearing too much the killer robots. 
And when we talk about artificial intelligence, it's actually a fairly fuzzy word because psychologists, cognitive scientists, mathematicians, we all use it interdisciplinarily uh, and there's no one clear definition of artificial intelligence. But machine learning, which is one aspect of AI, is, that's a technology. That has a very clear boundary, and that's why we should be teaching that, it to the kids. And then within machine learning, we have things like neural networks or deep learning or GANs or these different kinds of technologies. And even though it seems like we are giving computers all these abilities, like ability to see, communicate, move, reason, maybe one day even to be creative, isn't because computers are any closer to our very humanity. It's because they have a lot of data. So if programming is giving step-by-step -step instructions to a computer to solve a problem, like the example we had earlier where you learn to brush your teeth, machine learning is solving a problem based on examples. Instead of brushing, giving step-by-step -step instructions to brushing your teeth, you would collect multiple different examples of brushing your teeth. And this advancement has happened because nowadays we have so much more computing power. We have specialized chips that are really good at doing the kind of parallel processing uh, AI and neural networks need. One of them is the GPU. And then we have a lot of data. So every time we click something online, every time we walk in a city, data is being created. And it's because of the data and computing power that all these algorithms that were done in the 1970s and 80s almost out of nowhere seem to have these magical abilities. But it's still learning through examples. So when we want to teach the computer to learn to play Go, we feed it hundreds of thousands of examples of Go games. When we want to teach a computer to drive a car, we give it examples of, of um, video of, of streets. When we want the computer to recommend videos for us, we need to feed it data uh, about likes of the past. And when we want the computer to recognize speech, we need to give it data of speaking. And data is everywhere around us, and it's one of the most complex things to try to explain to children, uh, to get them excited about it. But once they grasp truly the idea of data, it starts to become much easier to help them understand what machine learning is and how, while AI is magical, it's not made of magic, it's made of data. So in the past, we would give computers exact rules and now we feed it a lot of examples. So I'll give you a really quick walkthrough of wow, how the machine learning systems work nowadays. In the past, uh, if we wanted to recognize if this finger is a cat, we would give it exact instructions saying that a cat is an animal with two ears and a tail, and it comes in these five colors, and these instructions would be extremely brittle. They would break down easily, they would forget the complexities of the real world, and computers were not very good at recognizing things like cats. Nowadays, uh, instead of giving these instructions, we feed the computer lots and lots of examples of cats. And then the computer builds a model out of those cats. It looks at all of these different examples of cats and finds patterns we humans can't comprehend because we humans can't hold that much data in our head at the same time. And then it gives an answer. And very importantly, actually doesn't give an answer. It gives a probability of whether this thing here is a cat. And all of you who feel that computers will do our jobs, don't worry because there's at least three places in this chart where we will still be needing humans a lot. First of them is the problem to solve. Human, humans are curious and creative and we need humans to ask the questions and make the computers uh, do the work. Then gathering of the data, humans still do a lot of that and I, think, and I suspect that many of you will be somehow working in this field in the future. And then also the answer to the question. We need humans to think about whether this is a problem we want the computer to solve. Because there's areas of life where it's enough to know uh, the probability of something being right or wrong is 60%. But then there's things in our healthcare, in our judicial system, in our educational system, where we want human interference, where we want a human to check whether this thing should be decided by an AI or not. And the gathering of data is really interesting, and I know there's a lot of discussion here in Brussels around this. And I approach this with the children from a very practical standpoint. I say, here's an AI we're trying to teach what a cat, uh, the concept of a cat, what kind of bias, uh, a misconception the AI might get from only looking at this training data set. You can use really big words with six-year-olds, they understand them fairly well if you... Um, 
explain them slow enough. And the kids say, oh, maybe that all cats are grey. And I say, yes, draw now a stripy cat that is, I don't know, brown. And then I ask, we're trying to teach the computer to recognize a teacup. What are the biases they might learn from this set of training data? Well, that all teacups have handles. All teacups have handles on the right-hand side, and teacups don't have ever flowers or stuff like that on them. And these seem like innocent examples, but as we are automating more and more of our societies with AI, it really is important that we don't accidentally create an AI that thinks all nurses are female, that recognizes the skin uh, colors and the shapes of the eyes of different kinds of humans. And this means this is the very last moment we actually can introduce more diversity into the computer science industries. Uh, in a few years, it's going to be too late. And with children, we practice this a lot by drawing and collecting different kinds of training data sets. Uh, here you can see the problem of Northern Europe. Uh, the ch child was trying to teach the computer uh, what a happy person looks like by only collecting data from magazines. <laughs> and all the happy people seem to be white and blue, or like with blue eyes. And this here is my favorite example. This is a Singaporean girl who wanted to teach her computer to recognize a unicorn. And she was fiercely proud when she learned to <laughs> draw the unicorn from the behind. Yeah. <laughs> so we should be teaching kids, again, that while AI is magical, it's not made of magic. And we should tell them that what AI actually is, it's input process output. And for instance, when we want to teach a car to drive with. They use input car cameras. There's a process that maps the position of other cars, and then the output is the ability to drive. And within any one car, there's probably hundreds or even thousands of these different machine learning systems working at the same time. And what I would do in primary school is I would really spend time thinking about what are the tasks we humans are good at, and what are the things that are easy for a computer. Because hopefully for the future children, computers will be a wonderful sidekick, good at the exact things that we humans are not good at. So for one of us, it's easy to know all the possible moves in chess, but the other one is really good at comforting others. One can calculate gigantic numbers together, but for the other one, it's really easy to make pancakes and take into account all the chaos that might happen when pancakes uh, are being made. The other one can travel time and space and know uh, stuff that happens in New York. But the other one is really good at contextual uh, knowledge. And, and these are the kinds of differences I would try to uh, help the children see already at a young age. And that would mean that maybe in the future, dentists won't go through the radiation, um, the, um, uh, the, the um, uh, teeth examples to find the cavities in them, but they would have a sidekick AI that helps them do that. And then the dentist can be spending more time uh, in supporting the pe persons who are afraid or uh, don't feel confident going into the dentist's office. And one metaphor I've used a lot uh, to explain what this change looks like is the hundred languages. Reggio Emilia is a tiny Italian village uh, that has developed this beautiful new pedagogy and they have this poem that says that the child has a hundred languages of expressing themselves, whether it's sculpting, dancing, playing, singing. Uh, we should be encouraging our children to use computer science coding uh, and computers as one language to explore and look at the world. And we spoke earlier about how the plan is not critical. There's not going to be a moment when someone will offer us a blueprint into the future of technology education because technology is so highly uh, intertwined into the humanities. Uh, and we need to think about what kind of a country we want to be. In UK, they talk about a lot about how computing has deep links with mathematics, science and design. In New York, they say that computer science needs to make a meaningful, uh, we need to offer a meaningful um, experience of computer science to the children. And in Finland, uh, where education, equity, and technology have long roots, we've gone a little bit of a different route. So Finnish educational system really highlights the idea of play and recess time and minimal testing. And in addition, we have this really amazing culture of technology. From a country of five million people, it's an unproportionate amount of the open source technology that comes to the world. Nokia, Linux, Git, IRC, SSH, MySQL. 
And when we decided to introduce computer science into the primary school curriculum, uh, this is the entire curriculum we proposed. We said that during first and second grade, programming is taught through play. That's the most important thing teachers can introduce. Programming is taught through play. And then third and sixth grade students get to know a visual programming language and learn to give commands to a computer without being afraid of making mistakes. And these are discussions that can feel very sort of, ah, oh, do we still need to be talking this over and over again? But this is the reason. Um, uh, the reason for this is that technology is not a separate subject. It's intertwined in everything. And I'm, I'm going to finish with a final story, uh, and this one comes from Cambridge University, where they had been doing studies with children, showing them different sets of photos. And in one set of the photos, they had natural world items like woods, uh, plants, and animals. And in the other set of pictures, they had pictures of Pokemon species. And by far, the children were much better at recognizing the Pokemon. The researchers said they had more vocabulary to recognize the Bulbasaur than the Badger, the Pikachu than the Birch Tree. And they were worried because what happens in a world where we don't have vocabulary to express what is around us. And it turns out understanding and having agency over your environment in the natural world, it's important. But we have a similar situation happening in the world of technology, where we have so many of these suitcase words, these words that pack a lot inside of them, but let very little out, that we throw from one person to another, words like AI, Bitcoin, blockchain, that most people never understand and feel control over. And the definitions also change. One year I had a little boy who asked me, Linda, is the internet a place? And I start to explain to him that, no, no, internet is not a place. It's an interconnected network of computers. You can think of it as the cyber village, uh, information superhighway. You go surfing online. And then I realize, oh, wow, I sound like a kid of the 1990s. These were the metaphors of my internet. This child, he has never pressed the disconnect button on the uh, modem. The internet is something invisible everywhere around him. And I need to start changing my narrative. So is internet the servers, the fiber optic cables that go from the bottom of the sea all the way to the space? Or is internet the protocols that define the pieces of software that define how data travels around the world eight times in a second? Or is internet the cat videos and the Gangnam style and the funny memes that happen when the six billion of us can talk to one another, the explosion of creativity? And this is the challenge of technology. It's not hardware, it's not software, and it's not only the societal impact technology is having on the world. It's doing this free at the exact same time. And I'm going to leave you with a new kind of definition of technology. Because, you know, being a computer used to be a profession. So in some ways, the very first computers in the world were humans. In the Victorian era, England, being a computer was a profession for someone who made long calculations at a time when there were no calculators, so powers of two or square roots. And in some ways, I believe the very last computers, again, will be humans. And technology is an interesting thing. The word technology comes from Greek, and it's the techniques, uh, the tools needed to do the job. But it's not only the tools, it's also the techniques, skills, and competencies, very human things that we humans introduce to the problem-solving equation. And today's technology is the computer, but yesterday's technology was the bicycle or the combustion engine. And we don't know what the future of technology looks like, but we know we humans will be involved. So I asked a nine-year-old girl from Helsinki, or a bunch of girls actually, to define to me what is technology, what is it used for and who uses it? And this is the definition of one nine-year-old. And she says, technology is electricity that loves. I'm just going to repeat it because it's the most poetic explanation of technology you will ever hear. She says, technology is electricity that loves. It is used to play. I use it to have a conversation with my mom. We use a WhatsApp application. And then finally, and most importantly, people use it technology. Thank you very much. My name is Susanna Mack. I work for Microsoft. And, and I really want to welcome audience to, to raise your hand and ask questions. I'll start with a question of 
the first book that you did. Can you tell us a little bit about the story, how you went through that? Oh, yeah. So there's now four books in the series, one about coding and computational thinking, one about hardware, one about the internet, and one about AI and machine learning. And the first book uh, was started because, as mentioned, I was doing these little doodles in the like corners of my computer science books, and I started to post them online. I did. I have a, like a Tumblr or something like that, a blog, and then people kept telling me, "Oh, this is really cool. You should make this into a book." And I'm of that generation who was like, "Yeah, sure, I make it into a book." <laughs> and I had all these tools available that didn't exist for previous generations because I had the internet. So I put this project on Kickstarter, the crowdfunding platform, five years ago, and it absolutely exploded on there. So I ended up gathering almost $380,000 worth of pre-orders for this first book that didn't exist at the time. Mm -hmm. And it's a funny story because $400,000 would represent almost 20% of the annual book exports of the entire country of Finland. So all of a sudden, I was a first-time author who represented 20% of the country's book exports. <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea what I was doing. Uh, I barely, like, because uh, I, I thought that I was doing a book for my programmer friends, the moms and dads who I had met uh, throughout this other project I had been working on. And I think the one thing that kept me going was the idea that, uh, actually that I got from programming, the idea that, okay, even big problems are just small problems stuck together. And in programming, you make a lot of mistakes, but as long as you keep going, keep going, keep going, you'll get better. And that's what I pretty much did. It was the most nerve-wracking, uh, like horrible two <laughs> years of my life to get that first book out. Imagine doing something for the first time and having 10,000 people who are yelling at you all the time, like, when is the book going to be out? Now I'm exaggerating because most of the people were really supportive and nice and realized that this was a new project. And I still owe my whole career to uh, the Kickstarter community because without them, there would be no book, but it was also very stressful. <laughs> <laughs> but now, yeah, now the book is out and, and it's been translated into a lot of languages and it's my full-time profession to do this. So very untraditional journey into becoming an author. Right. So you meet a lot of children around the world. So I if you were to meet a girl or a boy who wants to actually become a nurse or work in the field of humanities and they might feel a little distant mm. to programming, how would you encourage them to get excited? One of the things that um, I tell a lot is that I never identified as a math person. Uh, when I was in school, I loved French, I loved philosophy, I loved uh, arts and crafts, um, and it's completely okay. Uh, but what I wish someone had told me at the time was, actually, when you're practicing French, uh, you need pattern recognition skills. Uh, because you need to recognize those verbs and their different tenses. And that's what programmers do all day long. They look for patterns. So, je parle un petit peu de français. <laughs> and then I loved knitting. And knitting, in effect, it's, uh, it's following a sequence of commands, a sequence of symbolic commands. And there's even loops inside of knitting. So, keep repeating this line until you come to the elbow. That's pure programming. And then finally, in philosophy, I really enjoyed formal logic. So I loved the work of Bernard Russell, who was trying to find an exact language between English and mathematics. And today we call it programming. So in some ways, I was a programmer. I just didn't recognize it myself. And uh, also the school and the society around me didn't recognize that these skills that typically uh, are not associated with programmers would uh, come out, or that are typically uh, associated with programmers would in like a young girl come out looking very different. Um, mm -hmm. So that's what I would tell them. And I would also tell them that actually the thing you feel is your uh, weakness when it comes to programming is your strength. Because you bring in a perspective that the current technology industry doesn't have. And now you might feel that, oh, I'm the person always asking the dumb questions, but actually you're offering a lot of wisdom and a lot of perspective. And when I go into a new situation and I realize I don't have a PhD in computer science, I don't have a degree in pedagogy. It allows me to do uh, and ask a lot of questions that people with very kind of narrow career paths are not able to ask. Mm. And then they can teach me and hopefully I can offer something for them. Well, you gave me a good tip how I should learn French. <laughs> so I need to start taking l take that into use. Any question from the audience in the back? Oh. Thanks. Thanks for the presentation and all the work you've done. Was, I mean, it's really interesting. Uh, me, I have two questions. Uh, the first question is, uh, mm, 
I suppose that you know Jordan Shapiro, no? Uh, yeah. He's the one of the most mm, evident experts on this subject. And uh, he, he said that video games are the new tales and uh, we shouldn't be fair of video games. It's something maybe different from your subject, but anyway, it's quite uh, yeah. similar. Um, so a comment on this. And the other is that uh, it's, li it's like uh, saying to him that uh, sometimes parents should put away the technology from the children is kind of anathema. So mm -hmm. while it can be a way to educate also yeah. to stop the use. And then, okay, a second reflection was about the use of the images to, to teach the, the coding. Me, uh, when I learned coding, uh, I was uh, 11 was uh, in the 80s. I'm from the 70s, but mm. uh, it, it was <laughs> in the 80s. And in fact, I think that it helped me a lot. The first book that I got in this training that I got was really made by images, like something mm. like that. And I think it's very important to you this kind of things uh, to, to teach to, to the children. Mm. Uh, a, a distinction which is quite important is between coding and use the technology. Yeah. Because I think Absolutely. coding is a way to express the creativity that you have is this way of debugging uh, for example is something that is is really uh, ve um, very interesting and it's something that you cannot learn when you use passively mm. a technology thanks absolutely um jordan shapiro is a wonderful guy and he has a new book out that everyone should read it um it issue like it talks about a lot of the parental concerns uh parents have, and one of my favorite um, like narratives from him is the idea that we spend so much time with our children teaching them manners. We say that to them, like, say thank you, say please. We do this every single night at the parent, like the dinner table. But when it comes to technology, we get frustrated with our children very easily. Like, I told you already to put the phone away. And Jordan gives very actionable advice on how to model the kind of behavior you want your children uh, to do when, um, when they are using technology. And he's, one of his main points that I completely agree with is the idea that um, not everyone has these childhood memories of what it feels like to do wonderful things with technology. So a lot of us have done Little League or taught uh, football or, you know, like we've done pastries with our children. So we know how to model those kind of behaviors of our children in a constructive way. But we don't have that experience when it comes to computers. And that means that we parents need to, or I'm not a parent, but we adults need to, uh, need to start exploring uh, computers and the world that our children live in today already now. And it might need mean that when your child is obsessed with Minecraft, you go actually and sit next to them and ask, so what is so interesting about this? Can you explain why this is so fun and what are the connections you're making here? Because often what we consider passive consuming of information can also be a wonderfully educational, highly complex social skills that the kids are learning. And Jordan does a far better job than I do in um, elaborating on this topic. So it's a really, really uh, interesting book. And then the second question was around sort of consumption uh, versus creation, uh, the idea of, of coding as a uh, sort of modeling these intellectual skills that you need in other areas of life. Uh, I completely agree, and in some ways I feel like we're doing this third era of ICT or technology skills, where the first era was the hobbyist computers, uh, computer scientists, uh, when actually coding was taught in classrooms, but no one really knew what the impact of it would be. So I have my mom who said that, oh yeah, I learned basic in school, but I, I thought it was really stupid and I would never need those skills. And then came the personal computer revolution, which was a wonderful thing and did amazing things for the world. But that meant that in the 19, late 80s and 90s, we spent a lot of time just learning to use the computer, whether it was the spreadsheet program or the, the Word or, or PowerPoint or so forth. And that was important. But now we're entering this third era of computer science education where we not need to start thinking what are the other things we can do with computers and how computers can be kind of the intellectual bicycle for the mind and how we as humans can do uh, really use computers as... Um, and for the things that they are really good at, and then hopefully also spend more time doing the stuff that we humans are good at. Um, I don't know if I have a more concise way of answering your question, except that uh, I think absolutely we should do be encouraging more, um, encouraging our children and, and ourselves to do more 
um, less passive things on computers. Any additional questions? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, in the in the, um, uh, in the modern life, like in the last years, let's say there is more use of mobile, and I'm wondering how, with the mobile, it can be possible to make coding. Mm. Like at my age, for example, but not because it was a better age, but it was mm. uh, the case. There were home computing. And then with the home computing, you could do video games and also uh, coding. That mm. was your choice. Me, I prefer to do coding. I preferred at that time to do coding than video games, but there were a lot of friends that were only video gaming. Mm. <laughs> now I'm I'm wondering myself, given that most of the kids they have the the smartphone and the tablet, how they can do coding mm. with the smartphone and, and tablet. I mean, okay, yeah, I'm a bit I out, uh, but so uh, again, I, I would look at the more difficult. yeah, I would look at the history a little bit more. So so the very kind of first instance of coding was the time when the the basic. Uh, women like they started like moving their physical where they vacuum tubes or something like that so programming was a highly physical activity and after the Second World War then came the mainframe computers and programming looked like the mm. um, the what are they called them the sheets of paper them punch, punch cards, cards yes exactly and then came uh, the personal computer and I think I at every hinge of this change there's been people who are like Never, I will stay with like the punch cards for the rest of my life <laughs> and I won't accept the next paradigm and then it always happens. And I agree with you, I have like, I, I live with my computer, I would never be able to like just use my phone. But then I see my parents or, or my grandparents who love their tablets and, and they can do so many exciting and creative things with it. So I think it's, it's just being able to recognize these hinges and, and like recognize that the, the paradigm is changing. And with software engineering, I don't see it's changing as quickly as some people say that, oh, like in a few years time, we'll all be just coding with our tablets or the computers will be coding our themselves. I think programming has more to do with natural language and we can see the progression of, like it's not the, um, the same as when you have hardware that gets the Moore's law or something like that. It's not exponential. We see the history of programming languages and they do change more um, like not as quickly as, as um, the hardware side of things. Uh, so I think it's going to take a while. But will programming look different in 20 years' time? Absolutely it will. And then we're just going to have to <laughs> figure out how to live in that world. Okay, I want to... Okay, go ahead. <laughs> I've just got a quick question about media, online media literacy and social media literacy. Yeah. We hear a lot about that at the moment. It's a big topic, especially for, um, you know, youngsters at, at primary school. Um, how would you, as an adult and a parent, um, advise us um, on mm. how to um, educate our children but at the same time not putting them off? Oh yeah, it's absolutely a really important topic and in the, the internet book I actually, um, I was thinking that should I just stick to the more sort of technical side of things like teaching the software and the hardware of the internet but then I realized that the societal impact that these experiences our children are having when they grow up online uh, are so important that we need to start teaching them. So I talk about privacy, I talk about fake news here, I talk about phishing attempts and one interesting activity is like a uh, it's a, a text message discussion between two girls and the kids need to decide which one of these text messages is a fact or an opinion. And it's a hard thing for, to, uh, for today's children to do and even sometimes adults. So in that sense, uh, yes, there's a lot of these um, like kind of soft skills that we tend to call it, even though it sounds a little bit derogative. Uh, that go into technology education, uh, but I think some of them are actually quite outdated because in schools you have these e-skills and social media skills classes and they prepare kids for a world that doesn't exist anymore, like advertisement literacy used to look very different when we didn't have targeted ads on Facebook that take into account your whole browsing history. And I do think that there needs to be more uh, discussions between the industry at the bleeding edge of thinking about how to make people buy stuff and then the pedagogists and educators that sometimes are still operating in a world of paper and like I, I remember doing these activities with children where it was like mark all of the things on the page that are advertisements and then realizing that hey wait a minute like these kids use 
uh, games that have like um, currency that is not real, it's one form of uh, advertisement, that, that is a much more complex world that the school uh, doesn't always necessarily, um, necessarily uh, recognize. Uh, so I think there's a lot of work to be done in that exact domain of social media skills and, and uh, like e-skills in general, and also privacy education. But also there I would maybe gauge uh, towards parents actually doing a lot of this stuff already. So in the same way, you don't throw a kid outside to the city and say, just figure it out, you'll get to the school on your own. You actually scaffold the learning so that first you walk with this kid to the school many times over, and then you go over the rules many, many times and say, look to the left and look to the right before going uh, over the street. I think in the same way, we need to start um, figuring out what are kind of the parental guidance uh, scaffolds that we need to build in place for our kids to enjoy online. Uh, experiences and then also be dedicated to going through them over and over again, not just saying that, hey, here you have a mobile phone, go figure it out, uh, but actually be a part of the lives of the children. So before we end, I want to say that we have a few books as a giveaway outside the room, and Linda has kindly promised to stay <laughs> up for a while so you can get your signature as well. Um, it w it's been a pleasure to have you here. We really enjoyed it. I think you just took the whole audience <laughs> with, with to the journey of a uh, whimsical world. Thank you so much for Thank coming you over for to Brussels. And yeah. Thank you so much for having me, and I, I do think that it's an important discussion we're having exactly here at the headquarters of Europe about these topics, because here you actually talk about not only the technical, not only the software, but also about the, the impact these things have on society. So really glad all of you took time today uh, to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you.